All right. We're going to continue uh, to talk about what does the Bible say about the future of Israel. Now, one thing we saw was the Bible really doesn't have any unconditional promises to anyone. There are times when the promise is made without, on that occasion, mentioning the condition, but God doesn't fail to mention the conditions on other occasions. He has said, there's a general policy I have. If I make promises to you and you break them, I'll, I'll break the promises. So that's why it's so irresponsible for people to say, well, if God doesn't keep his promises to Israel now, uh, he's an unfaithful God. Well, wait, he did, he did keep his promises to Israel and as long as he could, and they cast them off. Now, by the way, they did inherit the land. That did happen in the days of Joshua. And he did make Abram a great nation and the father of many nations. So, I mean, uh, these are things that God did for them. He fulfilled those promises. But in order for them to continue in perpetuity, they had to behave. They had to be faithful. They had to keep the covenant because the whole basis for their existence as a nation was a covenant. And as I was saying, the nation of Israel today has no such covenant. There's more atheist Jews in Israel than there are Jewish Jews who keep who practice Judaism. Uh, the number of atheists, fortunately, has gone down. Right now, atheists in Israel, the, the atheist uh, Jews, uh, they're only only about 20 percent now. But there's less than that of observant Jews who, who practice Judaism. Uh, but that number of atheists is down. Back in I think 2015. The number was 65 percent, so it's really plummeted. Uh, that, I, I, but, but unfortunately, those who have ceased to be atheists have not ended up in the church. Well, or if they did, the church was mighty small beforehand because there's still hardly any Christians who are uh, among, among the Jews in Israel. That's just that's just the, the statistics. You can go to Google, look as many websites, look up government websites, whatever Israel's websites, and yeah, I'm not making this up. This is this is what you'll find. I've looked at many just to make sure that I was vetting my information properly. Now, what else does the Bible say about Israel that might have something to do with the future? Well, I, I, I'm remembering now the things I was taught and that I repeated when I was a dispensationalist. One of those is that the Bible teaches there will be continual conflict between Isaac and Ishmael. Now, the Jewish people, of course, descended from Isaac through Jacob. And it is thought that most of the Arabs, or many of them, descended from Ishmael. I say it is thought because no one really has kept a, a complete record of this, but uh, it's generally believed that uh, many Arabs, many Arab peoples descended from Ishmael. And I'll accept that for the time being. So is there to be inevitably constant hatred and fighting between Israel and the Arabs because of this thing about Isaac and Ishmael and them being, well, where do we read, first of all, about this continual conflict between Ishmael and Isaac? I remember the first time I asked myself that question because I always had said it. Oh, the Bible says that the descendants of Ishmael, they're going to be fighting against the descendants of Isaac, and that's just, that's just the way it's going to be to the end. Yeah, except there's nothing in the Bible that says any part of that. The verse they use, and there's only one, is in Genesis. Chapter 16 and verse 12. This is spoken to Hagar about her son Ishmael. And God is telling her that even though he's been rejected from being the, the chosen heir of Abraham's line to bring the Messiah in the world, he's not going to do that, but that he's going to be blessed too. God's going to bless Ishmael as well. And he makes this statement about him. He says, Ishmael shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now that statement, he'll dwell in the presence of all his brethren, some people prefer to say he'll, he'll dwell uh, in antagonism uh, with all his brethren. Maybe. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. It doesn't matter to me which way it reads. The point is that he's a wild man, and he'll be hostile toward all other people. Well, that doesn't speak specifically of hostility toward the Jews, though the Jews are other people, so I guess that would include them. But this is a statement about Ishmael. It's talking about what kind of man he's going to be. There's not the slightest hint 
that all the descendants of Ishmael are going to be like him. And this is something that I think Americans often mistake. And I think it's because, I hate to say it, because I don't think this is consciously true, we think of people as ethnic identities. Now, I'm not of the view that, you know, this is a white supremacist nation or anything like that. That's not my position. My position is, when we say, well, Jesus was a Jew, the apostles were Jews. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and Moses, and David, and these heroes of ours, the prophets, they were Jews. So the Jews are good. Well, that's a non sequitur. Whatever your ancestors may have been doesn't tell us anything about what you are. And Ezekiel 18 specifically says, a righteous father's righteousness will not be imputed to his unrighteous son. Or a, an unrighteous father, his unrighteousness will not be imputed to his righteous son. There's no suggestion that if you have a good father or a bad father, that this somehow stamps your offspring, even in the next generation, much less hundreds of generations. There's not the slightest hint of this in the Bible. Now, have the Arabs always been hostile toward the Jews? I, I, I don't know. We don't, we don't see a lot of evidence of it in the Bible. There are times when the Edomites and times when the Ishmaelites and times when the Midianites, all of which were descended from Abraham, by the way, when they did attack Israel in the period of the judges, you know, these different uh, pagan nations that were not the chosen people, they, they made war with them. That included Ishmaelites, but not particularly the Ishmaelites, not more than these others. There's no particular hostility between Ishmaelites and Jews more than generic anti-Semitism that exists with many pagan nations. And really, I real problems between the Jews and the Arabs began largely when Jews started moving in large numbers from Europe, especially, into Palestine. This is before Israel became a nation. They were moving in there for decades before it became a nation. <clears throat> and, um, and largely, the Arabs and the Jews, many of them lived peaceably with each other. In fact, I was listening to a, a YouTube the other day of a, a, a Orthodox rabbi. You may have seen it. Long bearded Orthodox guy in his Orthodox clothes. Uh, he was on a Al Jazeera interview of a Muslim woman that was, was interviewing him. And he was saying, uh, unbeknownst to Americans, Orthodox Jews don't believe in Zionism. They don't believe in the state of Israel because they believe that God said Israel has to repent first. And since Israel has not repented, they do not see this as a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, I'm not sure if there's some Orthodox Jews that would contest that. I don't know what every Orthodox Jew thinks, but he said there's tens of thousands of Orthodox Jews that that's their way of seeing it. And he, he, he said he weeps for the Palestinians because of the injustice is done. And that, you know, he's, he's anti-Israel, not anti-Jew. He's not anti-Semitic any more than Paul or Moses were when they decried what the Jews did. But he's anti the state of Israel because he, he knows things about it that many Americans don't. I know some of them because I've studied it in recent years more, but uh, many Christians have no idea. And therefore, Palestinians tend to be targeted, or not, not as much now, but I think now too. Yeah, definitely it happens now, just, what, a couple of years ago. Um, a Palestinian journalist, a woman, was shot by Israeli troops. And the next day, when the Palestinians were carrying her coffin to her funeral, the Israeli troops came in and tried to bust it up because they didn't like what she wrote. This is not a free country in all the respects that we think of a free country. It's true, Israel has been much more, I believe, open to the Arabs in their borders than we would have expected them to be. There's even Arabs on the Knesset. But, um, but there's still harassment. If a Jewish boy throws a rock at an Israeli tank, and there's a notable case of this, he, his sister, and his parents are all put in jail. And, uh, you know, it's like the whole family's punished because he threw a rock at a tank. Now, was that tank endangered by a rock being thrown at it? No, they just were angry because he was hostile toward them, so they punished his whole family, took his home. This happens. This is in not so long ago. Now, I do believe that we only hear about the injustices done by the other side, 
And there, and there may be more injustices done by the other side. Certainly in this recent conflict, the other side, I think, is inexcusable. I mean, punishing, killing civilians, babies, women, so forth. I mean, there's no question that uh, Hamas, which doesn't necessarily have the interests of the Palestinians at heart. The, Hamas is Palestinian in, in ethnicity, but, and, and Palestinians did vote Hamas into power, probably at, you know, gunpoint. But um, many people in Hamas, or in, in Palestine, are suffering, and many of them are Christians. I think I mentioned 7% of the Palestinians are Christians. That's 14 times the percentage of Jews that are Christians in Israel. If you meet a Christian in Israel who lives there, the chances are 14 times greater that that person is going to be an Arab than that he's going to be a Jew. Now, I mean, that should give us some perspective. We're not talking here about a righteous, godly nation. Okay? Now, this hostility between Ishmael and Isaac, there's nothing in the Bible that says this is continual. It was a, it's a statement about the man, Ishmael. It describes what kind of a man he was. There's no predictions that his offspring will or will not be that way. We might say, well, there's been some cases where it seems like the Arabs are a lot like that. Yeah, there's cases when the Jews were like that. There's cases like when Americans were like that toward the Indians. And there's certainly cases when the Indians were like that toward the European settlers. I mean, there's been a lot of bad behavior to go around. There's no people who are always good. But to say there's a special hostility decreed by God which requires us to take a stand against the Arabs because they're from Ishmael and God predicted they'd be against Isaac and we're on their side because that's God's people. That's fabricated from whole cloth. There's not a single scripture that would say that. Now, let's talk about the restoration from the exile. Perhaps the most important verses that um, dispensationalism quotes are verses usually from Ezekiel, but there are some in, uh, there's some in Isaiah, there's some in Jeremiah, there's some in some of the minor prophets, where it says that God is going to restore the exiles from all the nations where they've been driven, bring them back to their land, and establish their nation again. No question. It does predict that. When were those predictions actually made? Well, when did Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel live? And the minor prophets. When did they live? They lived before or during the Babylonian exile. In other words, Israel was already scattered or was soon to be scattered to all the nations by Nebuchadnezzar. And they spent 70 years in that condition. But before that even happened, Isaiah and Jeremiah, and then during the exile, Ezekiel predicted that God is going to gather his people back to the land and restore the nation. He did. It was in 539 BC. A guy named Cyrus, a Persian ruler, conquered the Babylonians and gave all the nations that Babylon had taken into captivity, gave them permission to go back to their ancestral homes, including Israel. And of course, for us, the most important thing in, is in Old Testament history is that Israel was given the right to go back in fulfillment of the promises God made. He fulfilled the promise. They went back. It was Zerubbabel and, and Joshua the high priest that led them. Later on, Ezra and Nehemiah, not very much later on, took a bunch of them back too. Only a remnant came back, but the prophets had said that only a remnant would come back. God never said all the Jews are going to come back. He said a remnant, the faithful remnant, could come back. And they did. Over 500 years before Christ. Now, after that happened, the only predictions about Israel and geography that we read about are the predictions that Jesus made. That Israel is going to be conquered by the Romans, the temple is going to be destroyed, and the Jewish people will be scattered to all the lands. So we have the prophets in the Old Testament predicting the scattering of the people in the time of Nebuchadnezzar and predicting the return of the people in the time of Cyrus. And then Jesus predicts they're going to be scattered again. And in my opinion, Zechariah predicted that too. He's hard to interpret, but I think that's what he's talking about. Now, when then, after that, was a promise made that God would bring them back from that more recent scattering in 80, 70. Where, where's the promise that they'll come back from that? Jesus made none. Paul didn't mention any. No New Testament writer did. There's nothing in the New Testament that speaks of them coming back. Again, after 70 AD. 
So, what if God does not bring them back in the end times and establish them again? Is he unfaithful? No. He promised it in the days of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel. And he fulfilled it 500 years before Jesus was born. No other predictions of any return of the people, thank you, uh, have ever been made in the Bible since that time. Now, let me show you some of the scriptures that they like to use. Uh, I remember when I was growing uh, weary of my dispensation system because I kept finding that the Bible didn't say what I was teaching it said. I began to wonder, where are those scriptures that talk about God bringing the exiles back? Well, there's in quite a few prophets, there's a line here or a line there. But the, the main scriptures, and I found this to be true recently with every dispensationalist who's now talking about the present situation, they always want to go to Ezekiel 36. That must be the best one for them. And 37, both of which do, in fact, talk about God bringing the Jews back and reestablishing them in their land. And remember, Ezekiel was, along with the Jews, in Babylon and in all the nations. They weren't just in Babylon. Babylon had conquered all the nations of the region, and the Exiles were scattered among them. The Jews were in all the nations of the region. And these prophecies come along. And uh, let's start here. Um, uh, okay, chapter 36. It says, um, oh, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong book, Jeremiah. That's why. I'm not finding the passage I'm looking for because I'm looking for Ezekiel chapter 36. Okay, this will be this will be better since it'll say it'll say something about the subject. All right, um, all right. Um, verse uh, 19. God says, "So I scattered them among the nations." Past tense. He's not talking about a future scattering. In the future, from his point of view, he's talking about a scattering that happened already. He's using the past tense. I scattered them in the Babylonian exile. I scattered them among the nations. And they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. And when they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, wherever they went. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, now where are the house of Israel at this time he's saying it to them? They're in Babylon, like him. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations, wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned, in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am Yahweh, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations, and gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness, and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Now, did this happen? Yes. God brought them back. He, they had a new heart. Now, see, I, someone was arguing, with, oh, how do we know that the people who came back with uh, Zerubbabel were repentant? Well, you want to read the Bible? In uh, Ezra 1.5, it says, Though all whose hearts the Lord had touched came and went to Jerusalem. They, they were moved by God. These were repentant people. That's why they wanted to build the temple. That's why they were willing to make such a long trek through the dangerous wilderness to build their temple. And they were committed to that. Most Jews in Babylon were not. Most of them just stayed there, but the remnant came. And now what about this pouring of spirit out? Well, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but first we need to look at chapter 37, because this is the other chapter that's most often used. This is the vision of the dry bones, and we, we won't read it all because it's kind of a long narrative. Ezekiel sees a vision of uh, a, a wasteland, a desert, a wilderness, 
and there's dry human bones scattered all over the place. And God says, Son of Man, prophesy to these bones. And so he prophesied to the bones, and they began to rattle and shake and assemble themselves, and they stood into full skeletons, and then flesh and skin and hair came upon them, and they looked fully human, except that there's no, no breath in them. The same word in the Hebrew that means no spirit in them. Okay? Now, here's what... Then God says to Abraham, I mean to Ezekiel, prophesy now to the, to the spirit. Ruach in the Hebrew. It can be breath, it can be wind, or it can be spirit. In the previous chapter, I will put my spirit in you, probably means not wind or breath, but spirit. And this is prophesying the same thing that chapter 36 was, but different images. Prophesied to the spirit. And then the spirit came in him, and they came alive. And then God explains it. And it says in verse uh, 11, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel, not will be in the end times, are now, while they are in Babylon. They are the whole house of Israel. They're scattered away from their homeland. They indeed say, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. That was the attitude the Jews in Babylon had. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves. This is figurative because they're not literal bones. They're people. Uh, these are, I'm going to bring you to life again as a nation. He's not talking about the resurrection of the last day here. I'll open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves. I will put my spirit in you, just like chapter 36. And you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. Now, these two prophecies, 36 and 37 of Ezekiel, they say two things are going to happen. God says, I'm going to take them from all the nations where they've been scattered. I'm going to bring them back to their own land. That was signified by bones that are scattered being reassembled. They weren't alive yet, but they were reassembled and looked fully human. There was nothing more to reassemble them. That was when Israel came back from Babylon to Israel and reestablished their nation. They were reassembled, but they weren't alive yet spiritually. He says, then prophesy to the spirit. And he also says in chapter 6, I will put my spirit on them. I'll put my spirit in them and they'll do my work. Well, when did that happen? Well, that happened at Pentecost. It was the return to exiles in Jerusalem that the Spirit was poured out upon on the faithful remnant who happened to be believers in Jesus Christ because only believers in Jesus Christ are faithful in any sense to God. You cannot be faithful to God and reject the Messiah, the King that he sent. Jesus said, whoever does not honor me does not honor the Father who sent me. You can't honor God and reject Jesus, no matter what John Hagee says. Now, these people came back, God reassembled the nation, and 500 years later, he poured his spirit out on the remnant. It was the remnant who came back, and it was the remnant in Jerusalem that he poured his spirit out on. We call them the church, we call them the faithful disciples of Jesus. Only they can be called the faithful remnant of Israel. The rest of Israel crucified him. And so Ezekiel predicts a restoration of Israel in two phases. One, the regathering of the Jews to their land, which happened in the days of Cyrus, and the pouring out of his spirit upon them subsequently, which happened at Pentecost. Now, the early Christians understood this kind of prophecy as being fulfilled in their time. Because there's quite a few prophets that speak of God pouring out his spirit like a river in the wilderness and everything blossoming and budding and bringing forth fruit and so forth. There's lots of reference. Rivers in the desert. Isaiah especially, but other passages too, talk about God pouring out his spirit as rivers in the desert. Uh, Isaiah uh, 35, uh, I think it's verse 15, 14 and 15 specifically say that these rivers of water are the spirit poured out on them. Well, God didn't pour out his spirit on, on the remnant when they came back from Zechariah. Maybe, you know, maybe some of them 
you know, they had a changed heart, but his spirit was not poured out on the remnant until Pentecost. And the New Testament writers who quote verses about that outpouring in Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah, they apply it to their own time. That is, the church in Jerusalem believed that they were seeing the fulfillment. One of those prophecies was Joel chapter 2, where God said, and I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your old men and young, uh, your old men will see dream, dream dreams, and your young men will see visions, and I'll pour out my spirit on your maidservants, and so forth, and they'll prophesy. That's Joel chapter 2, I think it's verse 28, but Peter said, this is that. He said it at Pentecost, this is that. There's one outpouring of the Spirit predicted again and again in the prophets, just like there's one return of the exiles from Babylon again and again. It's a common theme of the prophets. God sends them into Babylon. He restores them from Babylon. Then he'll pour his Spirit out of them. And Peter said, this is that. Now, we can disagree with Peter if we want to, or we can make up things in the Bible to say, yeah, but there's going to be another outpouring on Israel, and there's going to be another regathering in the end times. Really? Now, some people say, well, Steve, you're kind of on the, uh, on the wrong side of the a cue ball here because don't you know that God has in these last days restored the Jews to Israel I mean your interpretation is that this doesn't mean that but it has happened against all odds how could you not think that's a fulfillment of prophecy well one reason is I can't find any prophecy that is fulfilled by it even J. Vernon McGee didn't think it's a fulfillment of prophecy he said no they got to become believers first and then they can come back now, I don't think that's come back at all because they came back already 500 years before Christ and there's never another prediction of them ever coming back after that. But the truth is what has happened there is not a fulfillment of any prophecy because there is not a covenant nation called Israel anywhere on this planet right now. Not even in the promised land. They are not a covenant people. They don't acknowledge God. They don't keep his covenant. They, they have met none of the conditions for the blessing, but they have met all the conditions for the curses to remain upon them that, that uh, Deuteronomy said would be upon them. And I don't wish it on them. I have no, I have no animosity toward Jews. Again, I've had many friends who are Jewish. I, I think they're some of the most uh, witty and fun people I've ever known. I've never had a, a bad thought toward a Jew. I'm just talking about the Bible here. If you say you're not a Zionist, and that means you don't necessarily think the Bible teaches that this is a fulfillment of prophecy, people say, oh, you're anti-Semitic. I've heard Dennis Prager say that on his show. He said, if you're not a Zionist, you're anti-Semitic. I think, well, wait a minute, Dennis, you're a smart man. I, I like to listen to Dennis Prager. He's a smart man. I agree with him most of the time. But wait a minute. Isn't anti-Semitism racism toward Jews? Okay. What is Zionism? It's a political philosophy. Zionism means you believe that the is people of the Jews should and, and will come to Jerusalem and own that property. Now, I can, I can doubt that and still not be, I don't have to be racist. You know, I, I don't think any of you have a divine mandate to inherit any particular piece of property. I'm not against whatever race you are. Racism is an entirely different thing. Zionism is a political movement, and it was not started by godly Jews. It was started by an atheist Jew. Theodore of Herzl and, uh, in the 1800s. But it really got some momentum when dispensationalists jumped on that bandwagon because they believed that's supposed to happen. And they pushed and they pushed and they pushed and they pushed until President Truman finally gave in. And if you don't think that's a, a correct interpretation, read books on modern Jewish history written by non-Christian Jewish historians. Every Jewish historian will admit that the modern nation of Israel is largely something brought about by dispensationalist American, American and British evangelicals. So, okay, and my, my, my Zionist says, well, yeah, but God could use that. He could. The only thing is he gives me no scripture to give me that interpretation of the facts. God has not promised to do this. and. If we're talking about these passages, he, uh, uh, he hasn't done it at all. Not only not in fulfillment of scripture, but it, he just hasn't done it at all. Let me show you something in Deuteronomy uh, chapter four. 
and verse 40. Moses said to Israel, You shall therefore keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord your God has given you for all time. God's given you this for all time, but you can only prolong your days there if you obey. Just like I said, a wedding vow always says, until we die, we're committed. But the assumption is both parties mean it, and both parties are going to do it. If one ditches the marriage, the other guy's free, or a woman. And, uh, you know, a, a permanent covenant can be broken if it's a permanent covenant based on conditions. And every covenant in the Bible actually is. If you look at Deuteronomy chapter 30, God talks about um, the Jews being scattered and being brought back. And he is describing the Babylonian exile, I believe. In chapter 30 of uh, Deuteronomy, verse 1 says, Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I've said before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today and your children with all your heart and with all your soul that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity. Now, did you see any uh, prerequisites there for bringing them back? They're going to call on God with all their heart, soul, and mind, and he's going to bring them back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts of under heaven, from there the Lord God will gather you and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land. And I'm going to skip on down because he says a lot of the same things. Then he says in verse uh, 9 and 10, the Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in all the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord again will rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers, if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes. Okay, this, this is stated at the beginning and at the end of this section. If you obey, I'll bring you back to the land. That hasn't happened in modern times because they haven't obeyed. In fact, they haven't been brought to the land, really. I mean, uh, less than half of world Jewry has actually come back to Israel or lives in Israel. Some of them were born there. They didn't come back. Uh, probably a pretty significant portion of those who were there didn't come back. They were born there in the last 75 years. But, but uh, still, not even half the Jews in the world live in Israel. Almost half, but not quite. But it's not Israel because it is not a covenant nation. Israel has never had any significance in the Old Testament except as the covenant nation of God. The covenant defined them the breach of the covenant defined their dissolution. They were sent into captivity in AD 70 because they rejected the Messiah. Jesus said that was why. If you read uh, Luke chapter 19, Jesus predicts because they didn't recognize him, they're going to be destroyed by the Romans. He never predicted they'd come back. And they haven't. I mean, some Jews have migrated there. There's always been some Jews who lived there. There never was a time when there were no Jews there. The, the percentage of Jews that are there now... It's much more amenable to them since the United Nations gave them special privileges there. Of course, if I were Jewish living in a country where we'd been persecuted, I'd go there too. But that doesn't make it something God does. If God does it, it's going to be a covenant nation. Because if there's no covenant nation there, it is not a restoration of any nation that existed in the Old Testament. There never was a nation of Israel that was not in the covenant. But there is no covenant between God and them. Because why? Because God has made a new covenant in Christ. And that makes the Old Covenant obsolete, Hebrews 8.13 says. So that's why. Now, there's other uh, passages like this, but we can just say this uh, as a general statement, which is true. There are no promises of restoration to Israel back to their land that were ever written or uttered after the Jews had pretty much come back. Now, Zechariah does mention God bringing people back to the land. But he lived in a time that was still happening. It wasn't finished yet. He lived during the time of the exiles having returned, and they were still coming in. So 
He would be maybe the one exception after they came back. But he never makes any reference to the end times. And that's pretty important because Zechariah, especially chapters 12 through 14, are usually used as key passages about the end times. And Zechariah never mentions the end times. Interestingly enough, what he does do, he gives a lot of statements that are quoted in the New Testament in Zechariah, especially chapters 9 through 14, quite a few verses that are quoted in the New Testament, and the New Testament quotations apply them to Jesus and the apostles' own time. There's not a hint in Zechariah that he's talking about the end times of the world. And the, and the apostles who wrote the New Testament did not seem to have a hint about it either. They, they applied them to their own time in the first century, which is, to my mind, authoritative. Now, does the Bible predict that the Jews, uh, in fact, will be gathered in unbelief? Well, I've given you quite a few scriptures. We're not going to look them up because of our time limits. But the scriptures are in your notes. These are the scriptures that I pulled from a, a dispensational book where the author said, God promised he's going to bring the Jews back to the land in unbelief in the last days. So I put down all the references. I've also read them, but I won't read them now. You read them. See if it says anything remotely like that. See if any of these verses give the slightest hint that God will bring Israel back to the land in unbelief. He says again and again, it'll be when they turn to God that he'll bring them back. So uh, the fact that, uh, you know, he doesn't mention them turning to God in some of these doesn't mean they're in unbelief. Now, many people believe that God has predicted that all the Jews will convert to Christ. And we saw that in Deuteronomy, when he says, when you're driven to all lands and you turn to God with all your heart, then I'll bring you back. Now, okay, they've been, some people say they've been brought back. It certainly is not anything that the Old Testament really predicted. What's over there now, just a secular pagan nation that rejects Christ. How is that different than their enemies? Uh, you know, how is that different than any pagan nation? There's nothing in Israel that resembles a covenant nation of God right now. And so it hasn't happened. Something has happened, and it was done by a foreign body in Europe called the United Nations. The Bible never said that God would prevent the United Nations from doing anything in particular. And it happened because, well, the idea that the Jews ought to have a homeland of their own started with the founding of Zionism by a, a non-believing Jew in Europe. And uh, he started the Zionist movement, found other Jews that were agreeable, but not all Jews were agreeable. Lots of Jews say, no, no, that's not, that's not right. There's already people living there. Now, people say, well, you Americans came and took the land away from the Indians. How could you condemn anyone coming into Palestine and taking the land from the Palestinians? Isn't that the way history works? The land belongs to the people who conquered it last. Well, yeah, but it depends on how they conquered it. We can say that uh, we, we can't turn the clock back and undo what was done to the Indians in this country. We can't turn the clock back and undo what was done to the Palestinians in 1947 and 48. But we can say we can judge nations' behaviors on the standard of justice, and we will approve or disapprove of their specific actions on the specific standard of whether they did it justly or not. So that's where we stand. Now, how just, well, let's think about when America took, uh, when we took the land from the Indians. I didn't, and you didn't. So I don't owe them reparations. It was people I never met who did that. But, but I don't mind if we help them out. They've had a hard time. But the thing is, the nations, uh, this North America didn't belong to any one nation. The Indian tribes were independent nations themselves, continually at war with each other. They had bloody, merciless wars with each other, and they took territory from each other. There was no settled part of the United States that belonged for generations to one nation of the, of the people. Uh, now, I believe, since they were here before we were, we should have been kind to them, we should have been just, but there was lots of room, lots of room for settlers, too. And uh, no one can say that any Indian tribe controlled all the land between the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean. There's a lot of land to go around, and none of them had ever controlled it all. The continent was not theirs. Uh, the, the perimeter of, of what's now the United States did not ever belong to any tribe of, of Indians. 
I still think we did some harmful things that we probably shouldn't have done, that, that we should regret. But it's different when you look at what happened in Israel. Because although the Palestinians didn't have a nation either, they at least had lived for 1,300 years in the land and had reason to believe that the farms they were farming, really, they had the right to be there. Their ancestors had lived on them. Um, now, the truth is, and, and sometimes people say, well, the Jews purchased most of the land before they moved into it. So, you know, so they owned it legally. They didn't purchase it from the Palestinians, generally speaking. The land under the Turks, under the Ottoman Empire, had been divided up among absentee landlords in Turkey who owned it but didn't live there. And so they kind of technically owned it, but they didn't live there. And for centuries, they let these uh, Arabs live there and get the impression it was theirs. But then the Jews in Europe purchased these lands, and these Palestinians who'd been farming the land for centuries were just told, hey, you're out, we own this place now. Now, I'm not saying that Israel can't do that or the United Nations can't do that, but is that what we call justice? How would you like it if some governing body in China made the decision that the American Indians get this land now. And you just have to get over your home. They're taking it over. Oh, we have a governor here who might do that. But you wouldn't think it was fair. You wouldn't think it's just. And you can see why maybe Arabs that were treated that way were unhappy about it. I think you would be too. That doesn't mean they should do atrocities. And people who do atrocities should be condemned for those atrocities, no matter who they are. Now, does the Bible say the Jews will be converted to Christ? It does not. But there are a couple passages that dispensationalists have pointed out to me that they think may teach that. If you look at Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, condemning them. This is the woe to you, scribes and Pharisees passage. And this is how he winds it up, how it kind of comes to its climax. In uh, Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house, meaning the temple, is left to you desolate. That means uninhabited. God, God doesn't live there anymore. For I say to you, you shall not see me anymore until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, my friends who are dispensationists tell me, Jesus is predicting that the time will come when the Jews in Jerusalem will say, blessed is the name of the Lord. That means they'll be converted. And Jesus will then return because he said, you won't see me until you say that. So he'll come back after they're converted. And as Dr. Michael Brown likes to say repeatedly, Jesus is coming back to a Jewish Jerusalem, not a Palestinian Jerusalem. Well, I don't see anything here about Jesus coming back to a Jewish Jerusalem anywhere. Um, what I see him saying is, I've been teaching publicly and openly for the last three years among you. That's over. You're not going to see me anywhere. I'm not going to make any public appearances anymore. Un uh, until, and I take until to mean unless, you embrace me and stop persecuting me. You see, if I said to a child, you're not going to watch any television until you do your chores. <coughs> Have I predicted that they will watch TV or that they will do their chores? No, I've just stated a condition. If you want to watch television, you'd better do your chores because you're not going to watch any TV before you do that, until you do that. Until, in a case like that, means, you know, that's the condition for it. Whether you do it or not is up to you. And to say, you won't see me anymore until you say, blessed is he that comes to the Lord. He's saying, unless you become a believer, a disciple of mine, and embrace me, I'm not, I'm not going to show up here anymore. Now, they did see him with their eyes, many of them, when he was crucified. That was public. Many of them were cr crying out, crucify him. So, so they, literally, they did see him without saying that, but he didn't mean it that way. In John chapter 14, Jesus said to the disciples, I'm going away, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And the disciples said, well, how, how will you manifest yourself to us in authority? He says, well, he that has my words and keeps them, 
He it is that loves me, and I will love him, and my Father will love him, and we will come make our home with him, and we will reveal ourselves to him. In other words, only believers will see Jesus in that sense. He's going away. The world won't see him anymore, including the Pharisees, but believers will. And he's telling these Pharisees, you've seen a lot of me these past few years, but that's not going to be happening anymore unless you come over into my group. I'll, I'll let you see me. All my disciples get to see me in that sense, but you won't until you do. Now, someone might say, well, you're assuming that until means unless. I am. I am assuming that. But if someone wants to say it doesn't, do you see here a prediction of any kind? Only a negative one. You won't see me until this happens. Will this happen? He doesn't say whether that will happen. That's not predicted. It's stated as the condition. So there's no promise here that Jerusalem is going to be converted and Jesus is going to come back to a converted uh, Jewish Jerusalem. The main verse people use, and this is where we're probably going to have to end tonight, is Romans chapter 11. Now, this verse is often used to say that in the end times, all Israel is going to be converted. And dispensationalists say, and therefore then they can come back to their land because they will have called on God. Well, as I said, those promises that if they call on God, they can come back were fulfilled 500 years before Christ. There's not another promise made since then for them to collect on. They disobeyed again. Uh, uh, killing Jesus was like a pretty big infraction of the covenant. And Jesus said, therefore, your enemies will come and cast a siege mount against you, and they'll lay you to the ground and all your children within you and not leave not one stone standing or another. That's what he said to Jerusalem. Because you did not recognize the day of your visitation. So, uh, you know, they were destroyed because they rejected Jesus. By the way, have they, re have they reversed that? No, they haven't. They haven't received Jesus. So if God drove them out of the land, turned them over to the Romans, raised the temple and drove them to the ground because they rejected Jesus, how is it that 2,000 years later, they still have gotten no closer than they were to receiving Jesus? But God's changed his mind about that. Where? Where does God change his mind about things like this? Did he change his mind 75 years ago and say, I'm, I'm going to let you come back, and still 75 years later, they haven't come back to Jesus? Where is this in the Bible? It's nowhere in the Bible. That's the point. Now, let's look at Romans, because this is where many people say that the Jews will um, be converted. If, uh, I can't go through all these three chapters, because that's what it is. It's a three-chapter discussion, and if you don't pick it up at the beginning, you won't understand the end. Uh, Dr. Brown says that in Romans 9, 6, where we find Paul saying, uh, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. He admits that the, the Israel that they are not all of is the faithful remnant. But then he says the word Israel is used 10 more times before the end of chapter 11, and it always means the ethnic Jews, or the, as he says, the nation as a whole. And therefore, when you get to 11.26, and he says all Israel will be saved, it means the nation as a whole will be saved. Well, I don't, I'm not sure how he's able to get that out of it. Paul is discussing the question of God's fulfillment of his promises to Israel. But he doesn't, what dispensationalists think Paul's going to argue is this. I know the Bible says God's going to restore Israel and bring salvation to Israel. And that hasn't happened yet. Don't worry, it'll happen in the end times, like 2,000 years after I write the book of Romans. Then those promises will be fulfilled. So the dispensationists believe that Paul is saying those promises have not been fulfilled in his day and will not be fulfilled to the end times. But what did Paul actually say? He says in verse 6 of Romans 9, it is not that the word of God has failed to take effect or failed to come true. That's how it reads in the Greek. Uh, in the New King James, says, uh, has taken no effect. But uh, basically in the Greek says, it is not as if the promises of God, the word of God, have failed to come true. In other words, they have not failed to come true. It's not like that. It's not like they failed to come true. They didn't. They have come true. But not all are Israel who are of Israel. Now, he is indeed saying not all the Jewish people belong to the faithful remnant. 
But he's saying, you need to understand what God means when he talks about Israel. There are times, certainly in certain contexts, where he's talking about Jews versus Gentiles, definitely. There's times when he's talking about the nation of Israel. The word Israel means lots of things. It, meant it was a man's name initially. Then it was his family. And then it was the nation founded at Sinai. And then it was the land they lived on. And then it was the northern kingdom instead of the southern kingdom. The word Israel has had a whole bunch of meanings. We can't just pick and choose which one we want. Paul says they are not all Israel who are of Israel, meaning not all who are Jews are part of the remnant. And when God made the promises, he promised them to the faithful remnant, not to everybody. That's what Paul's saying. So it's not as if those promises to save Israel have failed to come true. They have indeed come true. You have to just understand who they were made to. They are made to the faithful remnant. And Paul goes on in chapter 1 and says, I'm part of that. I'm part of the faithful remnant. In, in uh, Romans chapter 11, he says in verse 5, Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now he's talking about himself and other Christians, faithful Jews who become followers of the Messiah. In verse 7 of chapter 11, he says, What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect, meaning the, the faithful remnant, have obtained it, and the rest were blinded or hardened. Now, Paul's trying to explain how the promises of God to Israel have come true. They have come true to a remnant. Now, if you read Michael Brown or, other, or dispensations on this, they'll say, well, the, Paul is saying the remnant was saved in the first century as a token of the fact that God will someday save the rest of the nation. Well, I suppose it could mean that if Paul said something resembling that. Let's see if he says anything like that. What he does say is the promises have indeed come true to Israel. But you have to know who Israel is. Who does God mean when he says Israel? He means that Israel, which does not include all the Jews because many of them are not that Israel. Many of them are apostate, but the faithful ones. And actually in Romans 9, 27, in this same discussion, he says, as Isaiah said, though the children of Israel be as the sand of the seashore for multitude, only a remnant will be saved. Oh, okay. The children of Israel is all the Jews. They're like, a, like the sand of the seashore, like God told Abraham his children would be. But even if the children of Israel are a multitude, Isaiah said, only the remnant will be saved. And what's, that's, that's Isaiah chapter 10. Uh, I think it's verse 20. But then the next verse says, For the remnant shall return, the remnant to the mighty God. Okay, the remnant is not coming back to the land. They're coming back to God. And only the remnant will do that. Because coming back to God is salvation, so only the remnant will be saved. That, I mean, Isaiah says it. Paul quotes it favorably. He's, this is his point. Not all the Jews are saved and not, never have been, even in Abraham's day. Or, I mean, I should say in the days after Abraham. But the point here is there's no prediction by Paul that all the Jews will be saved. In fact, he's only a remnant of them will be saved, like Isaiah said. Now, he goes on and says there in, in 11.5, even at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Okay, present time. He's not talking about eschatology. He's not talking about the end of the world. He's not talking about the second coming of Christ. He's saying, we're talking about now. As Paul is writing, at this present time, God has saved the remnant. Isaiah said, only the remnant will be saved. And look at it. The remnant is. That's what he says. And he says, the elect received what God promised, and the, and the rest were blinded or hardened. Now, he goes into, I won't give all the verses I'd love to. I did in my re written response to Michael Brown, but I won't do it here. My written response to Michael Brown, 268 pages, I think it is, uh, is at um, Matthew713.com. If you go to Matthew713.com, there's a thing that says uh, articles. Click on that, and one of the first ones listed, uh, and link there, you can download it or read it online is my response to Michael Brown. Okay, Now, so I won't go in there. I do respond to everything in Romans, and everything dispensational say I, I respond to everything, 268 pages. Uh, I, I find, I think it is uh, three, almost 300 arguments he gives in his documents, so I answer them all. Um, now, 
Michael Brown believes, of course, Paul is saying, since there is a remnant, that means they're all going to be saved later. But Paul says, no, they're not. Only the remnant will be saved. And he doesn't say, in the end times, something is going to happen. He says, no. Even now, there is a remnant, just like it was predicted, who are saved, like me. He says, he gives himself as an example. Well, is he a, what is he? He's a Christian. He's part of the church. He's part of the body of Christ. Then he goes into this illustration I'll, I'll go through quickly. It's probably familiar. The olive tree. Now, this olive tree illustration begins in Romans 11, starting at verse 16. Interestingly, in Jeremiah 11, 16, we find the basis for this illustration. In Jeremiah 11, 16, Jeremiah said, God said, you, Israel, were called a green olive tree and branches have been broken off. Now, Jeremiah is talking about Israel's is olive tree and branches have gone into captivity in Babylon. That's what had happened in Jeremiah's day. But Paul applies that to Jews who've been broken off the tree because they don't believe in Christ. And he says, let, let me just give you this. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. But, and if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, that is, you Gentiles, not, not Jews, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. So you're not part of Israel. The tree is Israel, as it was in Jeremiah. And it originally had only Jewish branches, but now some of those branches have been broken off because of their unbelief. They're not part of Israel anymore. Not all are Israel who are of Israel. The ones that are broken off for unbelief are not Israel anymore. They're not part of the tree. But Gentiles who have believed have been grafted in, so they are part of the tree now. What is the tree of Israel then? It's believing Jews and believing Gentiles. Believing Jewish branches and believing Gentile branches. That's what Paul describes. And he does say it is possible for you to be broken off just like the Jews were if you don't remain in fellowship with God. And he says and it's also possible for the Jews that were broken off to be grafted back in, just like you have been, since you have a wild olive tree, they're the natural ones, it's no difficulty for God to graft them in if they do not remain in unbelief. It's all conditional. He's not predicting that they will believe. He's saying, just like, and he's not predicting that the Gentiles will fall away. He's saying, if you fall away, you'll be cut off. If they stop falling away, they'll be batted on. In other words, he's simply saying, the tree is made up of, and only of, branches that are believers. Jews and Gentiles, and that's what the Israel tree is now. That's Israel now. And by the way, if you say, oh, that sounds like a re replacement theology. Not really. In the Old Testament, there were Gentiles in Israel, and there were Jews who were cut off from Israel. I, I mentioned that in our first lecture. If you keep the covenant, even if you're a Gentile, you're in Israel. You're like a native of the land. If you're a Jew and you don't keep the covenant, you're cut off. In other words, Israel in the Old Testament was also made up of Jews and Gentiles, based on their obedience to the covenant. There's a new covenant now made by Jesus, and Jews and Gentiles are included in Israel based on that covenant. And Jews and Gentiles who aren't in that covenant are not Israel, any more than they were in the Old Testament. Israel is a multi-ethnic tree, Paul says, and, and, uh, and it's not the only place he says it. But then he says this, in verses 25 and 26, this is the big one. This is the one they want to use all the time. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened in, in is, to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just like Isaiah said, he quotes Isaiah as an example of how the deliverer, the Messiah, will come and deliver them. Now, he says, so... All Israel is What does so mean? Thus, in this way. That's what the Greek word means. Paul uses a word that says, in this way. Uh, in, in Michael Brown's teaching, several times he says, the word there means on the heels of this. Well, only if you make up your own definitions. There's not a lexicon in the world that would support that. It's not a chronological word. But dispensationists want it to be chronological. Here's how they want to read it. I don't want you to be ignorant that temporary blindness has happened to part of Israel until the Gentiles come in and then 
all Israel will be saved. See, they make it a chronological thing. First, the part of Israel is blinded. Paul already said that back in chapter 11, verse 7. The rest were blinded. Okay, that happened. Then the Gentiles come in, and that's going on for the next 2,000 years. And then when they've all come in, then all Israel will be saved. So you've got a, a program for the end times in this chronology. There's no chronology in the passage. Paul doesn't say then, but in this way. That's what the word means. In this way, all Israel. In what way? Well, it's just described it immediately above the, the olive tree. God cuts off the unbelieving branches of the tree and adds believing branches and retains the believing branches over natural branches. And in that way, all Israel, the whole tree, all the branches, Jewish and Gentile branches that are faithful to Christ, they're all saved. And that's how all Israel shall be saved. And remember, he began chapter 9 in this discussion saying, or implying, why hasn't the promise that God would save Israel happened? And his answer in Romans 9, 6 is, it has. You just have to know who Israel is. Let me go through this with you step by step. Finally, we get to the olive tree. You see, Jews who are not believers have been cut off. They're not part of Israel. They are not all Israel who are of Israel. Only the ones who are believers are Israel. And Gentiles have been added on, just like in the Old Testament, a Gentile could be added into Israel, so they can under the New Covenant. And many have, and many will. And in this way, those promises that Israel will be saved is in the process of and will be fully fulfilled. So if you're wondering how God is going to fulfill those promises that he, he would save Israel through the Messiah, the answer is he already has been doing that for the past 2,000 years. He saved the remnant of Israel you know, on Pentecost. And ever since then, Jews and Gentiles have been coming in. There's not a temporary blinding of all of Israel that's going to be removed and then they're going to be saved. There's never been a temporary blinding of all of Israel. There's been Jews who are Christians throughout the whole period of the past 2,000 years, just like there's Gentiles who are. True, the majority of Jews were not, but the majority of Gentiles are not either. Believers are Jews and Gentiles, and through that whole period, God is fulfilling the promise he'd save Israel through the Messiah. The Messiah is at the right hand of God, ruling over his kingdom, and the Jews who received him and the Gentiles who received him are now part of the entity ruled over by the king of Israel, which is Israel, the olive tree. Now, but doesn't he say until the fullness of the Gentiles come in? Isn't that kind of uh, chronological? Not necessarily. He doesn't say blindness in part has happened in Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and then something else will happen. He doesn't predict something else happening. He just says, and this is how it works. This is how the promise is fulfilled. This is how all Israel is to be saved, like with the olive tree thing. Now, why does he even say then until the Gentiles come in? Because this project of including Gentiles is going to continue until he's done bringing in Gentiles. That might be the last day of history. He doesn't say something else is going to happen after that. As far as I know, Gentiles can still come to Christ right up until the day Jesus comes back, as far as I know. I, don't, I, I know nothing else. As long as Gentiles are coming in, the fullness of the Gentiles has not yet come in. But when they have, I assume Jesus will come back. Not, there's, there's not a prediction that Jews will come back. But, you know, after all the Gentiles are in, then the program is completed. Until then, there's always going to be part of the Jews who are blinded. Not all of them. There's plenty of Jews in the kingdom of God, in the church, but not all of them by any means, not even a majority. But that's true of Gentiles too. So this is where I'm going to have to leave it. Now, there's more in your notes, I think. Is there no more? Or is it just in my notes? <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah, there's the Zionism thing. Well, if you'd like more information about Zionism, you can ask me about it, or you can go to my website, uh, thenarrowpath.com, and look at the series, the topical series called What Are We to Make of Israel? There's a, there's a historic overview of how Zionism started, how it has developed, what it is like now. This, I can say, is unbiased. Now, dispensationalists will say, no, it's not, because you don't believe dispensationalism is true. Well, no, but I believe the Bible is true. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the Bible through the lenses of what the, what the New Testament tells me. I'm also looking at current events through the lens of what the New Testament tells me, which means I can favor Israel at times and disfavor them if they're doing things the New Testament say are evil. <laughs>
But remember this, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, I think it's 22. He said, if anyone does not love our Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Do the people of Israel, in Israel, love the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, 99.5% do not. That makes a pretty substantial majority. Uh, that's true in almost every nation too, not just Israel. We're not picking on Israel. What I'm saying is we don't have any right to give them a special break that other nations don't have. They had that in the Old Testament until God said, okay, I'm done. In Deuteronomy, God said, if you provoke me to wrath and you go after other gods, I will provoke you to jealousy. He said, jealousy, not wrath. And I'll take another people. Jesus said to the Jews in Matthew 21, in the story of the uh, vineyard keepers, who killed the servants, the prophets, then killed the son also so they could keep the vineyard. Jesus said to them, well, therefore the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation that will bring forth the fruits of it. God did promise that Israel would always be a nation, but they are not Israel, not all Israel, who are of Israel. Peter said to the church in 1 Peter chapter 2, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. All those things were things that God said about Israel in the Old Testament. Peter, who's a Jew, says that in the New. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Yeah. Stephen, in light of the, the uh, mosque deal and everything, I'm sure a lot of people was wondering about the war and the Muslims and everything like that. Do you think that the last two about Zechariah 12, 1 to 2? Right. Especially Gog and Magog, because that's the one that got Magog. Yeah, well, if you guys don't mind sitting a, a bit longer, I'll be glad to talk to Zechariah chapter 12. Or... I can dismiss you, and we can. Come, those who want to come back, I'll be glad to talk about it as long as you want to know about it. Uh, I don't want to keep my mom here all night, but I'll, I'll be glad to finish her. I do want to talk about it. Let me, how many of you want to take a break and maybe go home? Or feel free. Don't feel bad. It's late. It's, it's 8.30. Okay, well, I, then I'll just keep talking briefly here. Gog and Magog. <laughs> Ezekiel 38 and 39 is addressed to some unknown party called Gog, the chief prince of Magog. Now, Magog is, was a nation that isn't really very relevant in modern times at all. Um, and no one knows what the word Gog means. It's a mystery. There's never been any known historical character named Gog, who is the chief prince's thing, but it's probably a symbolic name. It says that Gog will be tempted when they see that Israel is a land of unwalled villages. Now, villages being walled or unwalled is not very relevant in modern times. In ancient times, walls protected villages from invasion, but uh, not anymore. I, I don't know any nation that depends on walls, e even us at the southern border don't, don't uh, you know, trust in walls. But unwalled villages, that's what Israel was when they came back. Remember, the previous chapter is chapter 37, where God says he's going to bring the people back to the land and from Babylon. And then Gog says, hey, these people don't have walls around their cities yet. Let's invade them. And we'll take spoil to ourselves. What do they want to take? Sheep? Cattle? Is, is there anyone around the world now that wants to invade Israel and take all their sheep, all their cattle? And they come down on horseback with bows and arrows and spears. Okay, this is a strange war to be fought in the 21st century. I, I'd say someone who wants to win a war would probably depend on more sophisticated weaponry. This is talking about an ancient battle. Now, it does say that God will come to Israel's aid, that fire and brimstone will come down and will consume five-sixths of the arm, army of God. It will take seven years to burn their weapons, which must be wood, uh, and it'll take seven months to bury all the dead. Now, what's that about? Well, there's two ways to look at it. Part of this must be symbolic. It's either the fire and brimstone that comes out from heaven, and the seven years it takes to burn the weapons and seven months to bury the dead. Either that's symbolic, or else the bows and arrows and the horses and all that are symbolic. In other words, 
No one can take this prophecy seriously without taking something non-literally. Dispensationalists will say, this is Russia in the last day, in Confederacy with Persia, which is Iran, and other Middle Eastern nations coming down to defeat Israel, but God defeats the invaders. Well, what about the horses? Well, Hal Lindsey said, well, you know, the Russians, in Russia there's these people called the Khazars, and they've always been skilled horsemen. Okay, but it says all the invaders will come on horseback. I don't care how skilled a horseman is, if the defenders have tanks, those horses don't have a chance, or the people riding them. A good minefield would just take them all out, you know? But the dispensation says, well, those could be symbolic. Horses, bows, arrows, those could symbolize modern vehicles and modern weaponry. Yes, they could. They definitely could, except then you're not taking that literally. You're acknowledging that a significant part of the prophecy is symbolic because bows and arrows represent some other kind of thing that aren't bows and arrows. So you've got symbolism there. Now, what if it is an ancient battle? Was there ever an ancient battle where five, six of the invading armies destroyed by fire and brimstone coming out of heaven and it took seven years to burn the weapons and seven months to bury the dead? I don't think there has been, but it's not hard to say those things are symbolic. I mean, something's gotta be. Either the weapons are symbolic and the horses and this is a battle that has not yet happened and will be fought with modern weapons, or it's an ancient war, such as it seems to describe, and the outcome is given in symbolic language. Now, fire and brimstone coming down from heaven is, of course, reminiscent of Sodom and Gomorrah. After Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, many of the prophets, even the Psalms, described the defeat of God's enemies as being consumed by fire and brimstone. Not because they literally were, but because just as God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, God will destroy these people. And so the imagery of Sodom and Gomorrah is uh, recycled. And, and the, the number seven is very commonly a symbolic number in the Bible. Revelation being particularly a good example, but really throughout the Bible, seven is used non-literally. So if I have to choose, do ancient weapons represent modern weapons? Or does the fire and brimstone in the seven years and all that, is that symbolic for just an utter defeat of, of, of Israel's enemies by God? I'm inclined toward the second. You can be inclined toward the first if you want to. Uh, in which case, I don't think you're being very objective. So, I think it's an ancient battle. Now, which one? It happened after the return of the exiles. That's actually stated in the passage. There were a couple of times when the very existence of Israel was threatened by pagan adversaries and, and the pagans were defeated. One of them is in the time of Esther when the Persian Empire was mobilized against all the Jews. And it was a crisis. And Esther is celebrated because she intervened to save the Jewish nation from extinction. And God, uh, you know, they, they have a, a celebration of that. You know, uh, Purim. Purim is today, it's not mentioned in the Law of Moses, but the Jews celebrate Purim to celebrate the victory over Haman that was given to them in the days of Esther. That could be what it was. or Another view is that it's when Antiochus Epiphanes in 167 BC tried to destroy the Jewish religion and people when he sacrificed a pig and defiled the temple, in the temple. And when he slaughtered the Hasidim, the faithful Jews, and he outlawed possession of the Torah or circumcising your child or resting on Sabbath. Those were outlawed on the pain of death. If, if the Jews had not been rescued from that, Judaism and the Jews would have ceased to exist as a distinct people or religion. It was a total wipeout. It would have been, except God raised up the Maccabeans, a group of Jewish priests and their friends who conducted spirit, uh, not spiritual, but guerrilla warfare against the Syrians and killed a bunch of them and drove them out and, and won the independence of Israel again. Now, these are both things that happened after the Jews came back from Babylon and before the time of Christ. Um, it's possible, I don't say you must see it this way, it's possible that Gog and Magog simply represent every pagan nation that will ever try to destroy Israel after the exile is over and that God will intervene to save them. As we know of two cases, he did. Interestingly, the Jews also celebrate that victory in what they call Hanukkah. There's two feasts that the Jews celebrate that are not in the Law of Moses because they 
they are celebrating great victories that God gave them against pagan invaders that would have destroyed them completely. Purim and Hanukkah celebrate the victory in the time of Esther and the times of Antiochus Epiphanes, respectively. So, um, so I think it's maybe one of those or maybe both or maybe all the attempts of the pagans against them in that era because if you read Ezekiel a lot, which I've done, and I've had to, I didn't enjoy it some of the time, I had to teach through it verse by verse a dozen times or more. Uh, you get a feel for it. You get a feel for how Ezekiel talks and his symbolism and things like that. And if you're not convinced of it, that's okay. I don't, I don't have to convince you, but I'm persuaded that this is an ancient battle that took place between the return of the exiles from chapter 37 and the coming of the Messiah. And um, could be either of those or another. But most people like to think, uh, at least dispensationalists, it's a future battle. Um, some even think that they'll really have wooden weapons. Hal Lindsey said the Russians are using uh, pressed wood that's stronger than steel for some of their weapons. He said that in 1970 in the late great planet Earth. I don't know if they're still doing that or ever were, but uh, that, that would burn a while. Seven years, not so sure if it would burn seven years. Things that you could blow it up faster than that. Uh, so I, I, you know, you've got to, you've got to take your pick, future war or ancient war. I think ancient war has all the points on its side. Now about Zechariah, Zechariah 12, is quoted very many times in uh, the dispensational eschatology. In fact, this is, in some cases, it gives the impression of being their favorite a prophecy on this. And it says, um, let me get to it. Wait for it. Here we go. Zechariah 12. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord, who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundations of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all the peoples who would heave it away and, and will surely be cut um, in pieces. Now, God is going to make Jerusalem a trouble to the people who try to attack it. All the nations that do. What's the time frame for this section of Isaiah? I mean, Zechariah. Well, what's immediately before it? Jesus is betrayed for 30 pieces of silver in the last verses of chapter 11. So this might skip from there to the end times, but there's no indication that it does. Um, this Prophecy goes through the rest of the book to chapter 14. And uh, in chapter 12 later on, in verse 10, it says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. And they'll look on me whom they have pierced. Now this verse is partially quoted by John in John 19 when he saw Jesus' side pierced. He says uh, on the cross, he said, so that it might be fulfilled, they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Shortly after that, God did pour out his spirit on the inhabitants, as the faithful inhabitants of Jerusalem. We call that the day of Pentecost. Again, this is one of the many Old Testament passages that talk about God pouring out his spirit after the exiles have come back to, uh, to their land. And it did happen, the day of Pentecost. So I, and I think, now some people say, well, I don't think that's Pentecost. Well, why would he predict this? And then it happens at Pentecost. We say, well, that's not it. That, no, no, it's another one. Well, how do we know it's another one? There's no, there's no mention of the end times anywhere. This is after Jesus is betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. The spirit is poured out. He's pierced. Blood and water come out. And look at ch chapter 13, verse 1. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Was there a fountain opened in the first century for sin and uncleanness? Yeah, the blood of Jesus. There's a fountain filled with blood, you know. Now, it doesn't, uh, this verse is not quoted in the New Testament, but certainly sounds to me like it's talking about what happened at the cross. Then in chapter 13, verse 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, 
against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 26, 31, as he's going to get sent, he said to his disciples, you're all going to forsake me tonight so that it might be fulfilled. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. We, don't, we couldn't ask for a clearer identification of the fulfillment of this verse. First century, not the end of the world. Okay, And as we go through, I, I, when you get to chapter 14, it says in verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, for I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity. The remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. The remnant are the saved. They were cut off from the physical city, but they became the spiritual Jerusalem and were not cut off from God or the identity of Jerusalem. And we know this because the New Testament frequently makes reference to this fact. Now, this is 70 AD. It talks about you know, cities going to be taken, the houses will be rifled, the women will be raped. It's going to be the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, that happened in the first century too. Now, if someone says, no, but this is talking, uh, there's things he talked about here that didn't happen in 70 AD. Yeah, if you don't recognize apocalyptic imagery, you can say a lot of things don't happen. Like in Zechariah chapter 4, when Zechariah sees two olive trees with golden branches feeding oil into seven candlesticks, and God says, this is the word of the Lord, to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And he says, who are you, O mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Okay, so a mountain's going to become a plain. Did that happen uh, in Zerubbabel's lifetime? Were, were there two olive trees actually bringing oil th through pipes? Is that how olive oil gets to lamps? Is it just to put, stick a pipe in the tree like it's a maple and you're drawing maple syrup? Is that how? No, olive oil has to be pressed and all that stuff. It's symbolic. These olive trees are providing the anointing when he identifies that these are the two anointed ones that stand before the God of all the earth. These are the anointing of the Holy Spirit to keep the lamp of Israel going. So, but it's symbolic. It's not a real lamp. It's not a real mountain that's being removed. This is apocalyptic imagery, very prevalent in Zechariah and Ezekiel, especially in Daniel and in some parts of the New Testament. Now, we see then in chapter 11 through 14, we have the betrayal of Jesus by Judas. We have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. We have the fountain opened for the cleansing of sin on the cross. We have the shepherd being struck, stricken and the sheep scattered, which Jesus said would happen in Gethsemane. We have the destruction of Jerusalem in chapter 14, 1 and 2, which happened, and Jesus predicted it would happen. Where do we get to the end times here? When do we get out of the first century? There's no indication that we ever get out of the first century. Now, it's true. After about verse 8 uh, or verse 10, it does talk about things that make no sense at all if taken literally. But for the rest of the chapter, I believe it is talking about the new covenant that is inaugurated in the first century and continues. And uh, I won't go into that all now. I do have lectures on these chapters of Zechariah, verse by verse, I go into much more detail, but I promise to be brief tonight. So um, I will say this. In chapter 14, verse 8, it says, In that day there shall be living waters flowing from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, half of them toward the western sea, in both summer and winter it shall occur. Now, this river of water, living waters flowing out of Jerusalem is mentioned also in Joel chapter 3, verse 18, uh, a river flowing out of uh, the, the house of God in Jerusalem. And of course, Ezekiel chapter 47 talks about this river flowing out of the house of the Lord and getting deeper and deeper and so forth. This is symbolic, but what does it mean? Well, Jesus, on the day of uh, Feast of Tabernacles, on the great day of the feast, in John 7, verses 37 and 38, Jesus stood up and said, If anyone thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believes... As the scripture has said, meaning, of course, the Old Testament scripture, there's no other. As the scripture has said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Living water? Living water flows out of Jerusalem, as the prophet said, as the scripture said. There's no other reference to living water in the prophets flowing. Jesus said, well, the, the scripture said, living water is going to flow out of people. 
Well, the only place I see that is when it's coming out of Jerusalem, which is God's people now. Those who believe in me out of his innermost heart will flow rivers of them. Jesus interpreted this living water and says in John uh, 7, the next verse, 39, he says, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit, which was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus interpreted this living water, which he also spoke to the woman at the well about, as the Holy Spirit being poured out through his people, Jerusalem. And if you say, I, I don't think the New Testament calls the church Jerusalem. Well, it does. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, you Christians have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of our God, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are written in heaven. Spiritual Jerusalem, heavenly Jerusalem, that's the church, he said. That's, Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, the Jerusalem which is above is our mother, as opposed to the Jerusalem which now is on earth. So Paul and the writer of Hebrews identify Jerusalem now as the people of God, the, the church. Um, so I'd, I'd say we do best by agreeing with the apostles because otherwise we're not agreeing with scripture because they wrote the scripture in the New Testament. So, um, so I believe, now I will say this too. Suppose some are, I, I still, I'm just so used to, I, I just think Zechariah 14 is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in the future at the end times. Well, think about this. Zechariah's whole ministry was spent encouraging the returned exiles to rebuild the temple and Jerusalem, which they did. And now you think, oh, now we know that the temple they rebuilt was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, but now we think Zechariah's not going to mention that. He's just jump over that 2,000 years to another temple that's never been mentioned in the Bible and say, well, that's going to be destroyed, Zechariah 14, 1 and 2. Well, so there's a temple standing in Jerusalem while he's writing, it is, in fact, going to be destroyed just like he describes. But he doesn't mention that. He just leapfrogs over that 2,000 years in the future and describes the destruction of another temple that has never been predicted to be built. That doesn't strike me as a likely scenario. And that's why dispensationalism does not persuade me that they are good exegetes of Scripture. To exegete scripture, you have to compare scripture with scripture. If you want to get more in depth about Ezekiel 48, uh, yeah, Ezekiel 40 through 48, the, the temple vision, or uh, Ezekiel 38 and 39, Gog and Magog, or these chapters of Zechariah, I have verse by verse teachings on them. I, I labor to show from comparing scripture with scripture what the most reasonable way is to understand them. But that's in a nutshell. You might want to mention the transcripts that you've heard. Oh, yeah. You may know this already, but there's a new site that someone made, someone in Seattle built it, that has all my lectures transcribed by artificial intelligence. And it's called openfail.com. Openfail. Fail. T-H-E-O. Yeah. And, and you can choose any of my lectures, and the complete transcript is there. And so is the audio. And it'll start playing the audio, and the line that is being read on the audio will be underlined on the transcript as the audio progresses, the line progresses. So it'll always be underlining what is being read out loud. Easy to follow. And if you want to, you can skip way ahead to any page in the transcript, insert the cursor there, and it'll start reading the audio at that point, too. It's, an, it's like magic. <laughs> it just another of all our volunteers did this. I mean, everything that our ministry has is done by volunteers. Usually they do it first and then tell me because it's easier to get forgiveness than permission, I guess. <laughs> but uh, every, good, every good thing and every perfect thing that's about our website was done by somebody who volunteered to do it on their own and who knew what they were doing, which I wouldn't. Uh, so anyway... Right. Transcript site, Matthew713.com, which is where Steve's articles are. And I mean, there's really an, an amazing amount of material, but that little resources link tab has a lot of stuff. So take a look at it. Yeah. And read the rest of the notes I handed out because that uh, gives you some, inf some information about the biblical view on Zionism.
we gotta go, but I just wanted to mention the Messianic rabbis today are holding, they're hanging their hat on one scripture that they stole about uh, about the New, Te New Covenant. It's in Jeremiah 31, 31. 31, yeah. uh, 35 through 37. Oh, yes. Oh, it yes. It says at the end of 37, I will cast off all the seed of Israel for that. For if the these ordinances end. If, 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 if the sun stops shining. Right. And stuff, and, you know, like well, impossible things. Okay. Let that's me, the only way he's going to do it. Let me read that because I want you to know that we, we can answer that easily. Oh, um, <laughs> Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Um, 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars by, for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, which it can't, and if the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, which they can't, well, if that were true, then I will cast also off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. So there's two things promised here. Uh, unless the sun and moon and stars stop shining, God says he will still have a nation of Israel. And he will not cast off all the seed of Israel forever. Well, I, never, I don't know anyone who's ever suggested that God has cast off all the seed of Israel. Paul said he was the seed of Abraham and Israel. He's, he wasn't cast off. That's the, this is the very thing that Paul is probably referring to in Romans 11. 1, where he says, what then, has God cast off his people? He says, God forbid, I'm, I'm in Israel. I'm not cast off. What are you talking about? There's a remnant of people still who are faithful Israelites. God has not cast off all the seed, only the ones that were incorrigible. He kept the good ones, the ones that were faithful, the ones who kept covenant, the ones who received Christ. Now, what about uh, that Israel will not cease to be a nation? Well, I mentioned earlier, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, speaking to the church. Now, Peter is a Jew, a believing Jew. Many in the church were also believing Jews, and of course, they were believing Gentiles too. But he says to his audience, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So the church made up of Jews and Gentiles and the apostles, is a holy nation. The very thing that God said Israel would be if they kept his covenant in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. But they didn't. So who's the holy nation now? The holy nation, the people who are holy, the people who are faithful remnant. So God has not cast off all the seed of Abraham. Of course he wouldn't. He said he would not. He, Israel has never ceased to be a nation. It's just that the remnant became a new nation. But they are Israel. So, uh, you know, he, you know they, they're just not... These people who use these kind of verses, notice they're all Old Testament verses. You wonder why? Because there's nothing in the New Testament to support their claims. Nothing. But if they would read the New Testament, they'd find out, oh, even the correct understanding of these Old Testament verses is explained there. So it seems to me that Zionists are Old Testament people. They do not read the New Testament enough to find out how the Old Testament meant what it said. And they do not base any of their expectations on any promises that are found in the New Testament, only Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament is obsolete. The promises were fulfilled and, and continue to be fulfilled to the faithful who are in, uh, of Israel, who are the remnant who are in the church, like Paul and Peter and others and us. Uh, I'm not Israelite, but I mean, I'm not Jewish, but I'm in Israel. I'm on the, I've been grafted into the olive tree that's Israel. 100%. 100%, 100% yeah. 1%. Oh, 1%. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 23 and me. So I'm, I'm less than 1% Jewish. So I, hey, so is Israel. I mean, it, it, the, the nation of Israel is less than 1% Christian. So I'm as Jewish as Israel is Christian. Oh, well. All right. Well, uh, yes, go ahead. 
Uh -huh. Right. Right. Scienti scientists believe that the second law of thermodynamics is going to bring an end to the sun some billion years on, if the Lord tarries. Now, I'm, I'm not sure that Jesus is coming to our generation, <laughs> but I'd be very surprised if he waited five billion years to come, because I'm not sure where we'd put all the people on the planet waiting for him. But, but the, the thing is, yeah, the sun is part of the physical universe and solar system, and it's therefore temporal. The second law of, of thermodynamics would destroy everything. And you think about it, every cell in a body, every chemical in a body, it's been around for 14 or 8 billion years. Every, every atom, yeah, every atom. Our cells are made of atoms, and those atoms were somewhere else before they are part of us, right? They've been around forever. Uh, well, not forever, but since creation. Now, I will say this. Um, I don't think we have to worry about the sun uh, blowing up five billion years from now if your great, 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 great grandchildren are around to worry about it. Because Jesus, when he comes, the heavens are going to pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. And there's going to be a new heaven and new earth. And that suggests that, <coughs> excuse me, the temporal, the temporal heavens and earth, including the sun and the stars, uh, are probably not going to be around anyway. I mean, God's going to do that instantly. He doesn't have to wait for billions of years. So, yeah, no worries about that. Um, although... Years in, right? What's that? Greta Thunberg. Oh, Greta Thunberg. Yeah, that's right. The end of the world is like 12 years. 12 years from 12 years ago when she said it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other questions before we're done? Yes. Super, super quick one. But that's not what it says. It, the first prophecy was to the bones to assemble. Right. And God defined that as bringing the scattered Jews from Babylon back to Israel, the physical gathering. Right. Then there was a second prophecy by Ezekiel to the spirit that came upon him. So the order of events is, you know, they, they get gathered to the nation again. And then later he pours out the spirit. Now, what, what many Zionists will say is that proves that they're not believers at the time they're called back. See, they believe in God gathering unbelieving Israel. So the gathering of Israel is the first part, and then the pouring out of the Spirit is later. So they must have been gathered in unbelief. Why? Why would that have to be so? They weren't. They weren't gathered in unbelief. It says in Ezra that they came whose hearts were touched by God. Um, uh, Nehemiah also speaks about that, how they'd come back because they turned to the Lord and so forth. But the Spirit wasn't poured out until Pentecost. The fact, the fact that they were believers doesn't mean as it means for us in the New Covenant, that they had the Spirit in them. Uh, you know, the Israelite in the desert, some, some seasons they were believers, but the Spirit wasn't upon them, except on Moses and 70 elders. Well, you know. this is too in chapter 36, um, verse 24, uh, I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water in you, and so on and so on. Then I will put my Spirit in you. Right. So, so his, his argument was based on the chronological timeline of that single verse when it but, but right, he's defining God sprinkling clean water on them and giving them his spirit as something that has to do with them becoming believers in Babylon or not, or not in Babylon. That, that, right, right. And he's saying, therefore, since God doesn't do that to them until he's brought them back, he's brought them back in unbelief. But it does not follow. It does not follow that if they were believers when they came back, that God necessarily sprinkled that water, which Titus, uh, Titus uh, 3, five says is the water of regeneration and poured his spirit on them. That happened in the first century when Christ came. So, so Christ is the fulfillment of the second part of that prophecy. It doesn't mean that they were unbelievers. It's just that God didn't do those things for believers until Jesus came and made a new covenant for them. Those are conditions of the new covenant, which didn't happen until the new covenant came. But that doesn't mean that everybody who lived before the new covenant came was an unbeliever. Yeah. Zerubbabel wasn't an unbeliever. You know? his, his only, his last point though too was in Ezekiel 38 and, and uh, in two different times um, verse uh, 8 and verse 16 where it says it shall come about in the last days that I'll bring so what he was saying 
you had said in the, in the, the, the answer on the, the radio show that you said, well, I don't think that there's anything in particular in the Old Testament that's talking about the end times. Right. So I said, well, well, obviously he didn't read this verse. It shall come about in the last days that I will, you know, I will bring you against my land. E either I didn't read that verse or I've read a lot more verses in the Old Testament that talk about the <laughs> latter days. Um, like when Peter quotes Joel on the day of Pentecost. So this is what Joel said would happen. In the last days, I'll part my spirit off it. The last days, I believe, uh, well, latter days and last days often simply mean days later than these, sometime in the future. Not in the immediate future necessarily, but it's not necessarily the end of the world either. Ages too, right? Yeah, I mean, the, well, the last, yeah. Uh, you, you read all the times in the prophets that talk about the last days. Many of them were fulfilled when Jesus came, you know. That was indeed the last days of the Jewish system, of the temple order. Um, but even the term last days doesn't have to be anything except later days, latter days, later than now, future days. You know? And it doesn't, it doesn't say the very end of time, even if maybe some translation will say the last days. But again, uh, Peter said, we're in the last days. In fact, check this out. Peter said the day of Pentecost was fulfillment of Joel, which said, in the last days, I'll part my spirit. Well, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, he, Paul said, all these things were types for us upon whom the end of the ages has come. He says the ends of the ages have come. Um, Peter said, in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says that Jesus was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last days for you. So when Jesus came the first time, that was these last days. Hebrews 1 also says that God, who at sundry times and diverse manners, spake in times past to our fathers by the prophets, in these last days has spoken to us by his son. Uh, John, in 1 John chapter 2, he says, little children, it is the final hour. And as you've heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now many Antichrists come, whereby we know it is the final hour. So, I mean, this is the first century was the final hour, the last days, the ends of the ages. Now, I suspect they may have been referring to the last days of the, of the Jewish order and, and the impending destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, if they were not, then at least there's nothing that would indicate they're talking about the end of the world because they always say it's happened in their time. They are living in that time. <clears throat> some people, many Christians believe, and I've heard some dispensationalists say this too, that the last days started at Pentecost and will end when Jesus comes back. So the whole age of the church is the last days. So there's different ways of taking it. But certainly, it is not possible in all of these cases, or even most of them, to say he is talking about the end of the world kind of last days. So, yeah. Tim? Steve, um, dispensationalists have attached themselves to the ethnic Israel and the land of Israel, and it's the hill to die on. Everything rests on times of Christ, the Jews, Israelites, the hill to die on was Abraham. And being the father of Abraham, the covenant of Abraham. Yeah. Why isn't that important today to dispensationalists? Because, well, they do mention the covenant made to Abraham. Mm -hmm. uh, but they don't understand it the way Paul did. Right. They say that they are Abraham's seed, and therefore they're the heirs according to the promise. Paul said in Galatians 3.16, he did not make the promise to Abraham and his seeds, plural, but to his seed, singular, which is Christ. So the seed of Abraham is Christ. And then in verse 29, at the end of that chapter, he says, and if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed, and you are the heirs, according to the promise. Now, well, wait, if he said it's only one seed, that's Christ, how can we all be Abraham's seed? Because we are one. That's what he says. There's no Jew, Gentile, male, female, bond or free. In Christ, all are one. In Christ. In Christ. All are one, and we that one is Christ. We're part of his body. He is the seed, and we're part of him. If you are his, you're the seed too. You're in him, the seed. And you are the heirs, according to the promise. So, by the way, the next chapter of Galatians, Paul talks about how he makes a distinction between the descendants of Abraham after the flesh, by which he means the Jews, and the descendants of Abraham according to the promise. Now, he makes it very clear we are the children of the promise. The Jews are the children of the flesh. And then he says, do you remember what it says 
in uh, Genesis. He says, what did Sarah say? Sarah said, cast out the bondwoman and her seed, which throughout that illustration in Galatians 4, he's been making out to be the Jews who are fleshly seed, like Ishmael was. Cast out the bondwoman and her seed, for the children of the bondwoman will not be heirs with the children of the free woman. And then Paul says, we, brethren, are children of the free woman. The Christians are the children of the free woman. They are the heirs according to the promise. And the children of the flesh will not be heirs with them, Paul says. So, I mean, but that's, that's not surprising because they've violated the covenant. And when you violate the covenant, you've got no promises left. Yeah. Because the promises are part of the covenant. All right. Thanks, Tim. And guys, good talking to you guys. Feel free to uh, dismiss.